why are we talking about saffron? I'm not going to tell you why we're talking about saffron at first. I'm going to read you a little bit first, just a paragraph um, from this amazing book um, on food and cooking by Harold McGee, uh, second edition, 2004. Really, if you're at all interested in um, what your ingredients are and how how cooking works and um, and um, various traditions throughout um, throughout the world, this is this it's is fair your book. to say. A, I peruse the book a little bit, a narrative approach to cooking, both at the level of why <clears throat> things transition when you do certain stuff to them and where the ingredients... To some degree. I mean, I guess it, it really appeals to both my scientific and my narrative side. So he's got, for instance, here, this is a survey. He's got a survey of temperate spices followed by a survey of tropical spices, and he spends a page and a half on saffron. I must say uh, some of the intemperate spices are my favorites. Yeah. You know, they're, they're the best, but a little bit angry. Uh, they're a little a little hot. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he has, has a whole whole page, whole thing on chilies and uh, capsaicin. So, you know, he, he goes chemistry, he goes molecular biology, he goes culinary history, he goes narrative, he goes cultural anthropology. It's it's great. So again, uh, On Food and Cooking by Harold McGee, just the first paragraph on saffron before we go into why we're talking about saffron. Saffron is the world's most expensive spice, a testament not only to the labor required to produce it, but to its unique ability to impart both an unusual flavor and an intense yellow color to foods. It is a part of the flower of a kind of crocus, crocus sativus, which is probably domesticated in or near Greece during the Bronze Age. The saffron crocus was carried eastward to Kashmir before 500 BCE. In medieval times, the Arabs took it westward to Spain and the Crusaders to France and England. The name comes from the Arabic for thread. Today, Iran and Spain are the major producers and exporters. They use saffron in their respective rice dishes, pilaf and paella, the French in their fish stew and bouillabaisse, uh, the French in their French stew, comma, which is called bouillabaisse, and the Italians in risotto milanese, the Indians in biryanis and milk sweets. So there's a whole lot more about the biology and, and such of saffron, but um, that's it in a in a nutshell. Uh, he says it's probably Greek. Some people think it's Iranian in origin. It's not totally clear. It's several thousand years old. We've been and apparently domesticated for several thousand years, which is r remarkable. Um, so it's either uh, a human creation entirely or um, the result of, you know, through artificial selection, uh, where we were actively putting stuff together, or discovery, um, for reasons that I'll talk about in a, in a little bit, um, of what was surely a mutation that wouldn't have persisted, um, that we then acted to help propagate and have, and have moved forward by several thousand years. Um, so we've been using it for pigment. Um, it's in some parietal art, some, some wall art um, in, um, from, from older humans, medicine uh, for various uh, ailments, which is what we're going to talk about here, and of course, spice. Um, although the description of it, um, you know, I, I admit that I think I've never had um, fresh enough saffron yes. to be so it's so expensive it that, that very quickly I've and... never really been able to determine um, a flavor but uh, it's said to have a hay-like aroma uh, and taste which when said that way one wonders why it's you know so remarkably coveted in in at least particular parts of the world um, so there's this paper um, that just came out in the journal Physiology and Behavior called Impact of Saffron, Crocus sativa slin, Supplementation and Resistance Training on Markers Implicated in Depression and Happiness Levels in Untrained Young Males. So I was just pleased enough with that title to end up reading this paper. It's written by, it's, it's a bunch of people, a um, bunch of researchers out of Iran, um, and one person uh, in... Uh, some France and U.S., but this is um, the the untrained young males being talked about here are Iranian young Iranian men um, who were um, and you know they started with thirty six and it went down to I think twenty eight. So they had fourteen men in one category and fourteen men in another. These are all men who um, you know weren't smoking or drinking or engaged in any resistance training any. Um, resistance training um, in advance of this. And to half the young men, they um, gave them a, uh, a series of resistance trainings for I think it was six weeks. And um, after the resistance training every day, they gave them a saffron supplement. And at the same time every day when they weren't engaged in the resistance training, they gave them a saffron supplement. And to the other, other half of the men, same exact resistance training, and they gave a placebo. Um, at the same moment. So the only thing that was different was the saffron, but they were effectively trying to control for the well-known phenomenon that resistance training also deals with depression. 
Mm -hmm. right? That um, resistance training itself um, is effectively an antidepressant. And so what, you know, is there going to be a discernible difference for men who aren't always already engaged in resistance training? Um, if you start them on it, will they get, will, will they get better? Turns out, yes. Will they get more better if you give, if you have them engage in resistance training and take relatively small amounts of saffron? <clears throat> the answer is yes. Um, fascinatingly. And so they looked at a number of metrics here. You can take my screen off sec because this is just, uh, uh, but let me just see what the, the, the things that they looked at that increased were, um, anandamide. Oh, I can't even pronounce this next one. I don't know what it is. T, uh, two arachidonal glycerol, <clears throat> also known as two AG serotonin. God damn it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, serotonin, dopamine, uh, and beta endorphin all increased, um, as did in just questionnaires, um, uh, reported levels of happiness in the resistance training plus saffron group, more than they did in the resistance training without saffron group. Um, I think I have that right. There's a little bit, there's, there are a lot of things they were looking at, so I, I may have put one of those things in their wrong column, but all of those things definitely increased in both groups, uh, or um, the, the first did in the first group. It seemed like you had something to say. Well, before I was going to say, uh, I have recently come to the conclusion that if you're happy and you know it, you're not paying attention, but some of those people may just be on saffron. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't like this formulation. You don't like this formulation. If you're happy and you know, you're not paying attention. Well, I mean, it's it, 2021. It, yeah. But it's uh, a temporary it, condition to I, be sure. I hope so. Okay, so um, you know, one of the things that saffron seems to do, actually, and this is not from this paper, this apparently I did not know, so I just went down the saffron rabbit hole today. Um, there's a wealth of literature, most of which is not immediately available. You have to ask for it through interlibrary loan and such. Um, so I'm not going to show you any of the other papers, but um, on all of the actual known antidepressant effects of saffron, and it appears to have a very similar actual mechanism to uh, fluoxetine, which is Prozac, if memory serves, um, which is that it inhibits the reuptake of serotonin into synapses. Okay. So this may be where you're headed, mm -hmm. but the interesting thing here, we have a synthetic molecule that blocks the reuptake of serotonin. Um, for which you could make all of the usual uh, observations about the hazard of not knowing what the consequence of this will be. And then you have thousands of years of use of a natural molecule that does this in which we are safe to make the assumption that at least in the ancestral circumstance, this was not um, bad for the individuals and that there's reason to think that in fact, it was positive by virtue of the fact that it is not free to cultivate saffron. In fact, it's labor intensive, mm -hmm. and yet it persisted and spread from one culture to the next. Mm -hmm. So it provides no caloric benefit, and it's self-limiting in terms of the amount. So it is it is toxic in large amounts, but it's really hard to get enough saffron in any but right. a modern and incredibly wealthy environment to 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 hurt yourself right. with it. It colors things yellow, so it has a caloric value, but not. Caloric. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think that's worth noting in passing. I approve of that joke. All right. Yeah. <laughs> that joke. Okay. <laughs> Feel free to borrow that joke. That one has been approved. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. So, so yeah, the part part of part of the places to think about here are exactly what you just said. That um, finding a similar mechanism in uh, a molecule. <clears throat> that is in a plant that has had been in um, basically co-evolutionary relationship with humans for thousands of years um, is uh, knowing nothing else very much likely to be a lot safer than creating, synthesizing in a lab a molecule that has the same mechanism of action, but is also, you know, the, an additional reason why that might not be as safe. <clears throat> So aside from not knowing what the titration level should, you know, how much you should be taking and all of this, um, is, you know, what else is in the saffron? It's, it's a, it's a complex, it's, you know, it's pollen from a plant. Is it pollen? I think it's yeah, the pollen. It's yeah. Pollen. Um, pollen and threads, the little, uh, yeah, what, do, what do you call them? The pistils or stamens? I don't even remember. We're not botanists. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to hide behind that, but I probably should. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm trying to remember what the things on the top of the corn are, but anyway. Um, the threads. Okay. 
I think they're anthers. But anyway, go ahead. I don't remember where I was going. Um, you were talking about the uh, advantage of a natural molecule as compared to the synthetic molecule. So there, there's so much else also that you're getting when you're eating saffron, right? It's not just the lab synthesized molecule, which is what you were saying as well. But one of the pieces of the story that is not that I haven't mentioned yet, and there, there are many, but the one that I do want to mention before we move on is that... Um, the crocus species that saffron is, saffron is from is triploid, and it cannot reproduce sexually as a result. And it is entirely asexually reproducing. And um, basically humans produce it by separating it. Anyone who's ever planted bulbs knows, um, you know, sometimes it's bulbs, sometimes it's corms. It's just a, there's a botanical distinction between the two, but they, they seem similar to well, the... Un in this case, it's going to matter. Okay. This is more like uh, garlic than it is like an onion. And because it's like garlic, you can take a what's called a tooth, one mm -hmm. clove of garlic, and you can yeah, I, plant I, a garlic plant. I, from I it. believe that's right for for this species of crocus. I'm not a hundred percent sure is why I paused. Well, I think I think it's implied in the fact that it's a corm. It's a corm, not a bulb. Yeah. Um, so it's it's dependent on us, which means um, you know it's not it's not really changing. It's, it's benefiting from its association with us in which we take its, uh, take its pollen and, and eat it and paint walls with it and use it medicinally. Um, but it is, it is never reproducing sexually. And so there's a question, of course, again, of you know, where did it originate? Was it a mutation that would have been a complete dead end, but for the lucky discovery by you know, presumably a single human several thousand years ago that that was actually, you know, that when they, when they rubbed up against it and then wiped their hands on their mouth, they felt better afterwards. I mean, that seems like an unlikely series of events, yep. especially for them to then be like, maybe it was the orange stuff on my lips, right? right? Um, although it being so highly colored may have made it easier to trace. Yes. It also uh, suggests a, yeah, easier to trace, but it also suggests a reason that it might have been introduced into cuisine, mm, right? And mm -hmm. so- Just as a colorant. Right. And then it has this other effect. Yeah, absolutely. So- um, in trying to figure out some of what was going on with this with this species that is entirely dependent on humans, I ended up at this really confused website. And so this is my segue to the last thing we're going to talk well, about today. Well, wait, before you segue, though, I want to yeah. make one other point about this, which is there are really two things, at least two things, that make saffron, even if saffron is doing effectively the same thing as SSRIs that are synthetically made are doing, mm -hmm. Um, there are two reasons um, that the natural version is probably uh, much better. One is the one we've already pointed to, that uh, it comes in a context that is that has stood the test of time. But the other thing is it may come in a tradition that titrates it properly. In other words, yes. you are uh, hacking a Good. physiological system. Good. There are reasons that you might want to hack a physiological system rather than go mm -hmm. with your endogenous programming. For example, this won't be the case probably in Iran or Greece, but uh, if you change latitudes, for example, and your serotonin system was mm -hmm. not calibrated to your new situation, you might be able to use saffron to modulate it for, let's say, winter or something like that. Um, but were that the case, you would imagine that it would, you know, the world has not evolved with supermarket-like foods where you can source a strawberry, you know, in in February, mm -hmm. right? The world functions where foods become available at different times, and so traditions have built into them a kind of, uh, you know, a calendar of foods, as it were. Mm -hmm. And you might imagine prediction of the hypothesis that actually this does travel with humans because of its SSRI. Uh, like effect, you might imagine that foods that accompany the part of the year that you want to recalibrate would be high in saffron and that other parts of the year uh, might be low in it or something like that. Well, interesting too, um, actually, that um, you know, seasonal depression is something that afflicts many people and um, that would likely have been the case even pre-industrial lights and such. And <clears throat> this crocus, unlike most, although like some others, is autumn blooming. Whoa. So this, you know, this is, the saffron is becoming available and, it, you know, it doesn't save particularly well unless you've got um, deep freeze, basically. It, you yeah. know, it, fr it freezes okay. Um, and it's, you, you can, you, you basically heat dry it. <clears throat> 
and then it preserves a little bit, but it's going to be, it's it's going to be the most abundant and the freshest, exactly as the days are getting darker. So and, this is perfect. Yeah. It blooms at an odd time, and it cannot be preserved. Therefore, the prediction of the hypothesis is that it is properly uh, targeted to a uh, a place where physiology is desirably hacked, and that you can't screw up because it's very hard to have it at the wrong moment. Mm-hmm. That would be fascinating. Of course, that would require you to know which populations have an ancestral. It sounds like Iran and Greece would be two. But, you know, in order to figure out where the plant picked up that trick, you know, assuming that that trick is calibrated to a population, which population was it? Exactly. Interesting. Iran and Greece aren't exactly adjacent. You know, interesting that those are the two possible source populations. Yeah, but also that sort of fits in the story, too, um, because the, the nature so to catch people up because it's non-sexual. It doesn't produce a viable seed, Mm -hmm. right? Um, Which is uh, fine in this case because it produces a corm. The corm can be broken apart and therefore one plant can produce many plants by planting the corms and supplementing them. And so you get many plants, but it also makes it highly transportable, Mm -hmm. right? Um, That's true. So it may, you know, you can take the items and by keeping them in root cellar like conditions, they are dormant and you can travel over long Mm -hmm. distances. And so maybe not so surprising that non-adjacent populations both have a very ancient relationship with it because it only takes one person to carry it over a mountain range uh, for it to show up somewhere. Yeah, that's good. I like that. The Swedish, Swedish. I was just going to say that I'm about to mispronounce the Swedish name, but instead I mispronounced Swedish. Yes, you did. The Swedish lusabul bun with saffron is only available traditionally in November and December. Really? Love this. Fantastic. Yeah. Imagine that. Imagine that. Very cool. November and December even, Mm -hmm. when you might imagine that you wanted to interfere with the reuptake of serotonin by virtue of the darkening of the, uh, the days. Yes. Okay. It's almost too good. It's almost too good. 